Dear attendees and panelists, a warm welcome to ECROM webinar series on Global Voices, Heritage and Pandemics. COVID-19 pandemic has affected more than 180 countries in the world. It is not only a health crisis, it has affected all walks of our lives, including the heritage of humanity. Conceived within the framework of ECROM's international program on first aid and resilience in times of crisis, these webinars offer a platform for our extended community to share experiences and strategies. Together, we will reflect on how to support affected communities and strive for resilience of both tangible and intangible heritage while we return to a new normal. ICROM is grateful to all its partners and in particular to the Swedish Postcode Foundation for enabling this exchange. For those of you who may not know what ICROM is, it is the International Center for the Study of Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property. ICROM is an intergovernmental organization working in service of to its 137 member states. It promotes the conservation of all forms of cultural heritage in every region of the world. In a complex crisis situation, such as the current pandemic, when multiple sectors are involved, daily lives have been disrupted, how can we think of a measured response or recovery for cultural heritage? How shall we prioritize amongst competing needs? Who can help us? Today's webinar explains this by presenting an assessment tool called situation analysis. It is necessary first step for designing in-field actions in the humanitarian field. It also helps in identifying priorities, local capacities, existing weaknesses and threats. At the same time, it helps to coordinate actions and work with other actors. Often a situation analysis is a requirement for securing a grant in a crisis situation. Therefore, through their own case examples, our speakers today will illustrate how to conduct a heritage-centric situation analysis. Our panelists today are Ayas Abras, an officer working with UNICEF in Syria, Mrs. Mikiko Hayashi, who is a research fellow at the National Research Institute for Cultural Properties Japan, Ms. Halcyon Wilshire Busby, who is assistant archivist at the University of West Indies in Barbados and an executive member of the Caribbean branch of the International Council on Archives, Karbika. And finally, Ihor Poshivielo, Director General of the Revolution of Dignity Museum in Ukraine. All of our panelists have participated in ECROM's multi-partner training on first aid to cultural heritage in times of crisis. And we are very proud to have them with us today. Before I proceed further, I would like to apprise you of some house rules. I already see uh, people are using the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. You can send your queries, your comments via Q&A icon that you see at the bottom. We will take up some questions after the presentations by our panelists. In case we are unable to answer all questions due to the shortage of time, we will respond to them via email that we will share with you at the end. So reverting back to today's topic, that is analyzing an unfolding crisis. So for that, we have to understand and begin with a key question, which is what is situation analysis? Situation analysis is a systematic assessment for which specific pre and post event information is gathered, connected and analyzed 
to give an action plan that identifies immediate needs, people who should be involved, timeline of actions, and resources required. It also helps to identify potential resource partners. As the name implies, in a dynamic situation, situation analysis is periodically reviewed and updated to ensure relevance to ground realities. This tool can be applied to one institution or can include several institutions, or for that matter, it can be carried out for an entire sector. So the choice is very much yours. So let's get started with a heritage centric situation analysis. The first step is to know what is the wider uh, social context of uh, the uh, emergency, uh, context of the emergency in which it has occurred. So uh, because this would help social political uh, context of the emergency and this would help you to understand what are the capacities, what are the resources that are needed to deal with the emergency and what capacities exist in a certain context. So uh, you need to understand the social context, the political context, the economic and the cultural context, and which in the case of pre present pandemic is very different for every country. To illustrate this, uh, we are going to listen to a video recording of Ayas Abras, who is a, a officer with UNICEF and is a cultural first aider. So we are going to show you a video recording of Ayas Abras. Hello everyone and my warm greetings from Syria, a well-known country all over the media in the last decade. My name is Yas Abras, I'm a civil engineer and I'm currently working at the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, as a wash officer uh, based in Deir Zor. I'm basically from Aleppo, uh, one of the oldest cities in history according to many references and research. And this is something I'm truly proud about and truly uh, connected to. Today I'm here not to represent UNICEF, but as a Syrian citizen who almost spent his entire life here in Syria. I am delighted to be uh, part of this webinar and to share with you some of my experience in terms of cultural heritage in times of crisis, and this time is COVID-19 pandemic. As I mentioned a few seconds ago, Syria is a well-known country due to the ongoing conflict, complicated conflict since 2011. And before going into details in terms of COVID-19 and cultural heritage, I would like to brief to you the impact of the, the, the ongoing crisis in some key figures uh, very rapidly. So, People in Syria, as you know, have been suffering for almost eight, nine years. Over 5.6 million people have fled the country, majority to neighboring countries. Some 6.2 million people face protracted internal displacement. Women and children comprise the majority. Some 1.4 million people returned to their places in 2018. Uh, many struggle to survive and need support to rebuild their lives. Millions and millions continue to face grave protection risks, especially women, children, elderly people, and people with uh, special, dis uh, special needs, disabilities. 2.1 million boys and girls are out of school. Uh, further, 1.3 million are at risk of dropping out. We're talking here about an estimated 6.5 million people in Syria are uh, food insecure. An additional 2.5 million people are at risk of food insecurity, while 4.7 million women and children will need nutritional support. 46% of hospitals and primary health facilities are partially damaged or partially functionally or not function at all. Um, as a direct result of host, uh, hostilities, 4.7 million people in Syria are ne in need of shelter support. An estimated 15.5 million people are in need of water, sanitation and hygiene uh, assistance. Uh, 11.7 million people in Syria are estimated to be in need of some 
form of humanitarian assistance in 2018. Around uh, 83% of uh, the Syrian population is under the poverty line. Major, severe, and critical damages to almost all of the UNESCO, UNESCO uh, heritage, uh, world heritage sites in Syria and other heritage sites as well. Damages to movable and immovable uh, historical sites, uh, historical buildings, uh, to the Syrian heritage in, in, in general. Even intangible, there is significant damages to the intangible uh, cultural heritage as well. So the main question here is what can COVID-19 impact more in such a country like Syria? And to be honest, since I received the invitation, uh, I was asking myself this question uh, over and over. What else can COVID-19 impact more? And suddenly I discovered that I was asking myself the wrong question. And instead, uh, I started asking about what uh, or uh, why are we still alive? Uh, why am I, am I here still talking to you? Uh, what kept us alive? So in spite of all the recorded damages, uh, all of the humanitarian needs, uh, and the ongoing situation uh, situation so maybe it was luck maybe destiny but what i really believe and what i really figured out that what kept us spiritually alive is our shared cultural heritage and believe me when i say that we could fully enjoy a, a cup of uh, arabian traditional coffee uh, on top of a uh, debris pile in the middle of an Asian site, uh, such as the Asian city of Aleppo. Uh, and sometimes even there are missiles uh, flying over our, all over our heads and we don't care. It's, it's all about enjoying the passional moment, uh, to feel the connection with each other in such a a spiritually place, uh, our connection to our land, our uh, connection to our cultural heritage. Thank you, Ayas. As he rightly points out, that while COVID-19 will further affect the well-being of the people in Syria, it is equally important to focus on which are the coping capacities that would enable people to move on and how heritage could play a role in this. So in our situation analysis, whether it is for one cultural heritage institution or a site or the entire culture sector, we need to remember to identify capacities or abilities that would enable us to withstand as well as absorb shocks and stresses induced by disasters and pandemics. Um, I will share screen for the next set of questions, which are very important to ask in a step-by-step -step situation analysis are, so the questions are, where are you in the emergency timeline? Are you in a pre-crisis, during crisis or post-crisis situation? With relation to COVID crisis, this would translate to before social distancing restrictions or curfews or after, or are you in an in-between state that is of being partially open? Which is the heritage that is most infected? That is the next question to ask in a step-by-step -step situation analysis. And how that heritage has been impacted? This is also important to consider because sometimes it could be heritage is physically impacted or there is a physical damage like in other disasters. But in this case, it's the uh, people who are the carers or the bearers of knowledge that have been affected directly. Then you also have to uh, explain and try to identify what are the secondary risks to heritage. Uh, does it face the risk of fire, theft, or earthquake? And you have to have evidence to explain that. 
Now to explain and illustrate how, uh, how, how to gather answers for these questions, I would like to inv invite uh, Mikiko Hayashi from Japan and Halcyon Wilshire Bis Bisbee from Bar Barbados. Uh, first, uh, Mikiko will make a presentation and then Halcyon will also uh, follow her, will follow her and provide answers from her context for this, uh, for the same questions. So over to my colleague, Mikiko Hayashi. Hello, everyone. I'm from Tokyo, where the situation of the COVID-19 is one of the most serious areas in Japan. First of all, I deeply appreciate Ikram to give me this opportunity. Japan was the second country to report a confirmed coronavirus case outside China. The first coronavirus case in Japan was reported on 16 January 2020, and the government started the regulation from the end of January, such as immigration restriction. As for crisis timeline, we have 47 prefectures and first Hokkaido government declared an emergency in the end of February for about 20 days, and then Tokyo in the end of March. In the beginning of April, central government declared the emergency for seven prefectures. Fort Japan was under state of emergency from the middle of April. Our activity is restricted, although restriction is not the same with lockdown. The restriction does not have legal binding like fine. The emergency declaration was lifted in 36 prefectures just yesterday. The restrictions include closure of museums, libraries, archives, theater, and other cultural heritage spaces, and cancellation of festival. Many summer festivals this year are already canceled. And 2020 was an important year to host Olympic in Tokyo. However, Olympic is postponed to 2021. As to where are we in crisis timeline? We are during crisis in Tokyo, but 39 out of 47 prefectures are almost post crisis or the end of crisis. However, even after post crisis, there are restrictions on the movement of people across prefectures. So in a way, we are still not past the emergency and we are in and in between state. Which heritage has been impacted? As to which heritage is impacted most, I would say all types of heritage such as museums, historic sites open to the public, festivals, etc., are all affected. In Japan, we have about 1,200 museums and 100 in Tokyo. Under state of emergency, most of museums are closed. They have lost income from visitors and at the same time, closure could lead to decreased public engagement with museums. Intangible heritage is affected as well. Our annual festivals, traditional performances, etc., have been postponed. Since it is living heritage, it is difficult to predict long-term impacts on people and their cultural practices now. With intangible heritage, it is, for example, if festivals are organized one year later, there could be some economic impact and in terms of income loss. But if festivals are organized after a gap of a couple of years, there is a serious risk of loss, loss of tradition. However, it is apparently necessary to safeguard intangible heritage performers and artists. What are the secondary risks to heritage affected? Japan is a disaster-prone country. 
So secondary hazard can be earthquake, typhoon, fire, volcano. They can occur any moment. Even now we, we experience earthquake every day somewhere in Japan. Another secondary hazard is protection materials for stabilization treatment. For instance, we experienced devastating tsunami and many cultural heritage were affected in uh, 2011. And e even after 10 years, we, are, we have finished only half items. About 250,000 items are still left. For stabilization treatment, we have to secure protection materials such as masks, gloves, glasses, and Tyvek suit, etc., which are now needed in medical institutions. Nowadays, one after one disaster after another, every year we have to consider all these complex situations. How Understanding the wider context of emergency and identification of risks to heritage helps me as a cultural heritage professional. By understanding the risk and understanding that we are in the middle of health crisis, I understand that our capacity to act to protect, uh, to act on protecting heritage is limited and that we may need and, and the help of emergency actors to improve preparedness. In Japan, the system to face problem of coronavirus for heritage sector was set up in uh, the end of April. Agency for Cultural Affairs, National Center for Promotion of Cultural Properties and Tokyo National Research Institute for cultural property plan to solve the problem of museums individually. This system has just started. At the same time, Agency for Cultural Affairs, local government, and some, uh, some organizations started financial support for cultural art organization and artists individually for future restart. We update related information and news on our website. My own field, pro field project of training local community in Hokkaido, one of the worst affected areas, will focus on improving emergency preparedness for secondary hazards such as floods and typhoon, but major, uh, but these measures will take into account this directions uh, for COVID-19. I do believe that COVID-19 is a trigger for all foster resilience in cultural heritage field, as we did previous disaster. Thank you for your attention. Now uh, I pass to Haosion. Hello everyone. I'm Halcyon Wilshire Busby, Caribbean citizen and native of Trinidad and Tobago. However, I have made Barbados my home. Barbados was one of the last countries in the world to record its cases of COVID-19. With regard to the COVID crisis timeline, we recorded our first case on the 17th of March this year. A public health emergency was then declared on the 26th of March and due to end on the 30th of June in the first instance. Therefore, archives, libraries, museums, and other cultural heritage spaces have been closed. Curfew restrictions were put in place for the island from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. 
This then led to a 24-hour curfew. There was an ease of restrictions on the 20th of April. However, on May 4th, Restrictions were reduced and some non-essential services have opened on a phased basis. For example, the, conduct, the construction industry. Which heritage has been impacted? The cultural heritage that has most been most affected by the pandemic in Barbados is the festival of crop over dubbed the Sweetest Summer Festival, held in August, June to August, and the National Independence Festival of the Creative Arts, also known as NIFCA, held in November, the month of Barbados's independence. Crop Over, in the traditional sense, is an end of sugar harvest festival. The festival dates back to the time of enslavement of African people on the sugar plantations in the 18th century. In its modern iteration, the end of the crop is still celebrated with performances by soca artists in parties or fets, paying tribute to the literary arts, competitions of Calypso Monarch and Party Monarch and culminating with the parade of the bands to name some activities. The National Cultural Foundation states that crop over is considered a major financial stimulus in the country, generating some $80 million in economic activity throughout all tiers of society. With the COVID-19 crisis, our cultural, social, and economic life have been significantly impacted, especially with the cancellation of the festivals. Impact impacted our musicians, costume artisans, food, and food vendors, to name a few. The National Independence Festival of Creative Arts, NIFCA, showcases dance, drama, fine arts, culinary arts, photography, and film. It targets mainly schools and community-based organizations. According to the National Cultural Foundation, NIFCA today encourages artists to look at the innovations in the world, but still tell a story of who we are and what makes us unique as Barbadian people. The month long activity culminates at the celebration of independence from British rule on November 30th. The absence of these festivals would indeed leave a substantial void in society. Ramifications of which we have already begun to feel. What are the secondary risks to heritage affected. Being in the Caribbean, we are essentially at the epicenter of hurricanes and, and earthquakes. Our heritage is exposed to many other risks in addition to those stemming from the COVID-19 pandemic. In the midst of this, Barbados and the rest of the Caribbean region are faced with the approaching at Atlantic hurricane season that usually begins in June. However, it was recently stated that our hurricane season will start as early as today. With the first storm of the season currently brewing in the Atlantic. According to forecasters, this hurricane season is projected to be a tumultuous one. Additionally, Tropical and subtropical Atlantic sea surface temperatures are currently warmer than normal and are consequently also considered a factor favoring an active 2020 hurricane season. Museums, libraries, archives, and heritage sites will be, in, will be at increased risk due to 
these phenomena. Carnival artists who can also be impacted in this regard. Another secondary risk, I would argue, is lack of tourists to our destinations. Barbados' Barbados's economy thrives on having individuals come visit our shores. Without the patronage of visitors to heritage sites and to partake in our festivals, this may lead to the closure of some institutions and detrimentally impact our festivals. How understanding the wider context of the emergency and identification of risks to heritage helps me as a cultural heritage professional. By understanding the wider context and risks and looking at our new reality, I think decisive measures have to be taken to ensure the safety and viability of our cultural heritage. It is important to work closely with the Department of Emergency Management in Barbados and also the CEDEMA, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, and step up preparedness for cultural heritage sites and institutions due to the fast approaching hurricane seasons. We have to think of response strategies for safeguarding heritage that also respect the COVID-19 restrictions of maintaining physical distance. It is important during this time to economically support our artisans and artists in the sphere of intangible, the intangible aspect of our heritage, of our festivals. COVID-19 has certainly shown significant inequalities as it relates to the vulnerable in our society. In the absence of Crop Over and NIFCO festivals, the government of Barbados has embarked on a national training program to be conducted with schools and the wider community. This initiative will comprise of a campaign to fund, produce television, radio, and digital content. But it should be noted that artists themselves will require economic stimulus to continue their work. With the CARBICA, the Caribbean branch of the International Council on Archives, we are working to set up a cultural heritage emergency network. And this situational analysis will help us direct our efforts. Thank you very much for listening and thank you Ekram for giving me this platform. Thank you Halcyon. Uh, uh, both you and uh, Mikiko have uh, helped us to understand what are the multiple risks that heritage is exposed to, especially the risk of multiple disasters and how by discontinuing, uh, if we do not step in with stimulus packages now and step up our preparedness now, uh, we may we are at the risk of losing more heritage as a result of this pandemic. So once we have established what is the general context, which heritage is impacted and what are the secondary risks, it is important to identify who are the people involved. When I say who are the people involved, I mean who is in charge, who's coordinating emergency response, who are the main actors, relevant actors for cultural heritage. Here we also need to consider people who will be impacted by any action we take on heritage. And finally, we also have to consider which actions should be undertaken to respond and to recover and in which order and with what resources to illustrate answers for this set of questions with reference to his context and his institution, I invite the Director General of uh, Maidan Museum, Ihor Pashivaila from Ukraine to make his presentation. And I'll stop sharing my screen with that. 
So over to Ihor. Hello, everyone. I'm so pleased and honored to participate in the ECROMS webinar series and to share my experience in connection to today's uh, topic of analyzing the unfolding crisis. Uh, let me start with general context of the emergency. The first case of COVID-19 has been officially reported in Ukraine in early March. Two weeks later, the country stopped transportation and closed its borders for foreign visitors. The state emergency was declared and a number of quarantine measures were introduced. Public spaces, including museums, were closed by the government and local authorities. In Ukraine, there are almost 5,000 museums. Some of them are located in zones of military conflict in Eastern Ukraine and in occupied Crimea. I tried to identify risks, analyzing the broader context of the emergency. It happened that the pandemic was mostly spreading in Ukraine through tourists and labor immigrants who returned back to Ukraine due to the pandemic. Ukraine was not ready at once to effectively react according to recommendations of the World Health Organization. Our hospitals were lacking personal protecting equipment and medical equipment, not speaking about the museums and other cultural institutions. My situation analysis is mostly for my own institution, the Maidan Museum, which is located in the 3 million city of Kyiv, capital of Ukraine. I have tried to factor in how over two dozen museums in the city are impacted and coping with the emergency. So where are we in this crisis timeline now? As for today, COVID-19 pandemic has not impacted Ukraine as badly as China, Italy, UK, or the US. According to current official reports, uh, there are over 16,000 people infected in Ukraine, over 400 died, and close to 4,000 patients recovered out of the 42 million population in Ukraine. Now museums here are in a stage of reopening. Our government introduced a five-stage plan of the end of lockdown, starting from May 11. It was planned that museums and cultural institutions be open in stage one. It was unclear to me and my colleagues how we can reopen without health security protocols of actions and the mechanism of maintenance and protection. And what is much worse, how we can open before opening the public transportation. So it was important to me to answer the question, who is in charge of managing the emergency response? To respond to the pandemic in the Ukraine's government, um, uh, the Ukrainian government has worked out a national COVID-19 emergency response plan, established a national and regional emergency headquarters network. This slide should displays the basic model of the emergency response in Ukraine based on my situational analysis. I tried to identify who is responsible you can see blocks in red, who is involved and may be impacted, blocks in blue, and who can help, blocks in gray, on strategic, operational, tactical, and informational levels. So in my case, briefly, the prime minister is overall in charge, but at the city level, it is the mayor and all emergency agencies work under him. It is important also to analyze how heritage is, is impacted. In my case, my museum was impacted in many ways. First of all, our funding was dramatically cut off. To respond to COVID-19, the government needed some extra money. So the parliament overlooked the 2020 state budget, cutting over 50% of funding to cultural field, including 80% for my museum development. This put us at risk to stop all activities in developing the project for museum building, 
and its first construction. Also, we postponed our exhibition, educational and cultural programs, outreach activities, field trips, and international study tours. Our large memorial open air space in Kyiv's downtown became too vulnerable to secondary hazards, including vandalism and looting. Our collections and premises happened to be under less control because of limited access to them. Other museums and cultural institutions were also affected in mostly the same way because of financial cutoffs. For example, the construction of the National Museum of the Holodomor Genocide and the National Archive of KGB in Kyiv happened to be under the same risk as well. Also, my museum, as well as many other cultural and heritage institutions, has no emergency budgets and possibilities to provide health and security for both visitors and staff. In this situation, it is important to answer the following questions. Who are the people who would be impacted by taking action on heritage? In my case, it is firstly the staff, visitors, tourists, cultural activists, researchers, families of the people killed or wounded in times of the revolution of dignity, artists, students, and scholars who are engaged in our research, educational, cultural, and outreach programs. Next question, how understanding the wider context of the emergency and identification of risks to heritage helps me as a cultural heritage professional. I should say that situational analysis allows me, first of all, to make informed choices and immediate actions. For example, in my case, my strategy focused on immediate actions to get resources and create capabilities for reopening and return to normal functioning. Thus, we will need to prepare for the arrival of public, ensuring that museum and open public memorial spaces are safe to open, that these spaces are sanitized and equipped with sanitizer dispensers. Context-related restrictions are ad adopted and maximum number of visitors allowed in the venues are defined and publicly informed. The flow of visitors is adapted. I have applied to extra budget to provide staff with adequate protective devices and ensure cleaning and conservation measures. And then with the help of Minister of Culture and mayor offices, we can determine how my staff and people can reach the museum as the transport opening was initially scheduled, as I mentioned before, after opening the museums in the city. So the next important question is, who can help in this emergency situation and facilitate access to the resources? This question is crucial, as my colleagues previously explained. First, I identified, in my case, the key actors, such as prime minister, humanitarian and budget committees of the parliament, a cultural minister and the mayor who can help to get the right information on the restrictions, recommendations on the opening, uh, funding of my museum and starting construction of its building. We have issued dozens of official letters and open public appeals to the president, speaker of the parliament, prime minister and the mayor. Based on this analysis, I decided to engage with external actors such as European Union for funds to interact with public decently and increase digital access to my museum resources. It should be also mentioned that situation analysis helps first of all to apply for grant funding as it provides us clear vision of risks, capacities, needs, response strategies and outcomes. To influence COVID response uh, for cultural heritage internally. I have been participating in discussions with my colleagues from UNESCO, ICROM, ICOM, and museum directors and experts in Ukraine so that we can implement guidelines for public and staff, and staff safety uh, within our museums and cultural institutions. 
Now it's quite clear that responding to crisis requires finding public and private resources. They are needed for introducing new ways of cultural management to preserve and promote cultural heritage, to protect staff and to provide new opportunities for wide public access, to support the existing cultural sector, to advocate for cultural heritage carriers and bearers and infrastructure, to enhance capacities and exchange of knowledge. In conclusion, I'd like to stress that situation analysis is initial and very important first step of the first aid to cultural heritage framework. It provides, as it was mentioned before, understanding of the wider context of the emergency and enables first aiders to develop a context specific action plan. In my case, it helped me to quickly orient in the emergency situation and became ready for the effective response. Many thanks for your attention. And now uh, I have a pleasure to hand over to Aparna who will once again summarize the key aspects of a heritage centric situational analysis. Thank you, Ihor. Thank you for also reminding us that we have to uh, start thinking of caring for our heritage in new ways and find innovative strategies to involve all possible stakeholders, cultural right bearers, uh, cultural right holders, and, and then find a sustainable way for transmitting heritage to next generations. And uh, I also thank all our panelists for giving us uh, these insights from their respective and diverse contexts. In summary, as uh, has been already explained, these are the key aspects of uh, a situation analysis. Understanding the wider social, political, economic context in which the emergency has occurred. As we are seeing for COVID-19, it is different for every country because every country has different capacities to deal with it. And uh, there are also, the risks are also diverse and uh, different as has been pointed out by Halcyon and uh, my, uh, my colleague Mikiko, uh, Mikiko and uh, of course, um, uh, Ihor. Then we need to figure, um, figure out where we are in the crisis timeline, because this is crucial uh, before, during or after, because actors and stakeholders change accordingly and donors and resource partners also change accordingly. Uh, we also have to look at impact on heritage, which heritage, what are the values associated, what are the secondary risks, and then people involved, who are the rele relevant actors and stakeholders, actions, immediate, midterm, long-term and resources required. And finally, sources of information. Here, I would like to emphasize that it is important to understand that we cannot conduct a reliable situation analysis with the inputs of, uh, without the inputs of different agencies and fields, especially when several sectors are affected together, as also illustrated by our panel today. Furthermore, in a rapidly changing situation, periodic updating of situation analysis is crucial to inform actions and priorities and make your uh, program or your response relevant to ground realities. A situation analysis for a site or entire heritage sector can be done from afar, provided you know where to source pre-event and post-event data. Uh, such as flow plans, before and after photos, or as in this case of COVID-19 pandemic, visitors before and after lockdowns or restrictions or um, uh, inventories for collections, digital access. So all that is very important and it is a part of your preparedness for emergency response. This exercise, if carried out based on previous preparedness, can cost a minimal amount, especially if local staff or in, uh, of an institution is involved, or it could cost a lot if external expertise and on-the-spot surveys are involved. Information gathered through a coordinated and multi-sector situation analysis could help us to save time, money, and effort. So uh, therefore, we, working with local governments and humanitarian aid agencies 
to conduct such situation analysis is strongly recommended. Uh, if you want to get further information about this methodology, uh, download the First Aid to Cultural Heritage Handbook. I have given you the link here. And uh, if you uh, would like to first understand what is the First Aid to Cultural Heritage method, there is a brief three minutes video which you can watch. And again, the link is uh, given uh, there. So uh, with that, I will now request our panel to switch on their uh, video and audio feeds because this is the time for question and answer. So I request my panel to make themselves, um, you know, uh, available for question and answers. The first question actually uh, goes to, uh, just a minute, uh, to Halcyon. And uh, this is about how can we identify all risks, including secondary ones, affecting our intangible heritage? So over to Hal Halcyon. Sorry, um, something seems to be wrong with the video. It's okay, not a problem. Um, you yes. can answer like that. <laughs> okay, so um, you're asking about how can we identify risks? All risks. Uh, Including right. secondary ones affecting our intangible cultural heritage. You could give examples from your uh, own context. Um, uh, before, before you answer, Halcyon, I see that people are trying to raise hands. Uh, as we explained in the beginning of this uh, webinar, we would like people to put their questions and answers, in, uh, to write their questions in the dialogue box, in the Q&A box, which, and you can see the sign for Q&A, the icon at the bottom of the Zoom window. So please, uh, I request our um, uh, attendees to uh, do that. Uh, we won't be able to uh, answer questions on raised hands. We, we will take questions one by one that have been registered in the Q&A box. So please, uh, Halcyon, proceed. Thank you. Yes, please. So um, within the intangible context, where it's, it, I premise that we're extremely risk averse in that a number of our cultural bearers um, are on the backs of promoting themselves, sometimes without the help of government agencies trying to get funding from various walks of life. And this in itself proves to be quite problematic. And especially during times like these, it, it poses the, the question, what are they supposed to do during a time like this? For instance, within our context, within the carnival context, so I'm speaking regionally here during the Caribbean, a number of our musicians, entertainers, and so on, rely on travel, traveling within the region and the diaspora to, to actually make their money, to earn a living. And they bring along with them other people because it's not just an individual group, for instance, going on a stage and performing. Yeah. They, they move with a crew and they move with people. So you're talking about people in punk, like songwriters, um, musicians, um, vendors who people provide um, equipment for the setup of carnivals and so on. So it's, 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 it's quite far reaching in the community sense. Yes. Okay, thank you. So just to summarize what you were saying, I, I, if I understand correctly, Halcyon, is that uh, one has to look at how the, uh, the transmission, the access to markets, or the access to um, you know, um, uh, equipment for what they need to continue the tradition, their own personal well-being, income status, access to medical services, many factors are uh, intertwined and interconnected and then can translate. So that's only how, that's how you can look at the risk of it, uh, because for intangible heritage, you have to look at the far reaching 
uh, far wider, uh, you know, uh, links and vulnerabilities that uh, that a community might be confronted with. So uh, my next question is for Mikiko Hayashi, and this one is uh, actually about your experience in Japan. Uh, you have been facing a lot of uh, because you are in the you know a disaster prone country and, uh, and have several natural hazards uh, are exposed to several natural hazards so based on your experience of facing previous disasters how do you uh, how are you prepared for covid-19 disaster how how does that help you in dealing with the covid-19 situation mikiko uh, I think it's uh, and how to respond to disaster is uh, an uh, basic idea is same. So uh, not only uh, disaster, but uh, like pandemic. I think basic idea and sequence should be same. So an uh, phenomenon is different. But a uh, basic idea is I think uh, we, I can apply previous uh, experience to pandemic. Thank you, thank you so much. So yes, very correct. The basic idea is same. And uh, obviously with your level of preparedness in Japan, uh, you are uh, geared to deal with it in a similar way, but you may need some materials, some specific uh, materials like PPE or you know, to, to step up preparedness, right? Okay, yeah. thank you so much. So the next one is for Ihor. And Ihor, based on your experience, what lessons can be learned on what government can do for heritage institutions in order to prepare for such crises in the future? Ah, you have to turn on your mic, your audio yeah. uh, first of all i think that the government uh, uh, should include cultural heritage in in, in, in its priorities because uh, um, in my organogram which was also also the result of my analyzing how the emergency response works in this concrete crisis um, we have seen that the cultural heritage ministry of culture is not um, part of the headquarters, national headquarters. Um, and therefore, their possibilities are much more limited. So I think that in the future, um, in, the, this, in the emergency situations, in, when the crisis is unfolding, the Ministry of Culture should be among the other very, other very, very important uh, actors for emergency response on the governmental level. Uh, because uh, in, from my experience, uh, cultural sector and museums were, um, were, were in a quite strange situation in Ukraine. Because uh, the information how to react, what to do, uh, they got this information the last. The museum professionals knew about that the public transportation is going to be closed uh, in, in the last turn. But the information that museum should be open first, we learned in the very beginning, there are five stages of reopening, but we learned that museums should, is planned by the government to be opened among opening public spaces, parks, markets, whatever else. And it was a big uh, surprise. And our ICOM national committee had a big discussions and worked together with the Ministry of Culture, appeal to the government asking not to make museum be open because they are not ready. There should be discussion, there should be, the government should provide uh, possibilities for all that measures which museums should undertake before opening their museums for public. Okay, thank you. Because I see that there was a related question about how did you convince uh, your government to open museums so early? So you have already answered that. Thank you, Ihor. And uh, the next question is kind of a general one, which I can ask uh, any of the panelists to answer. They say, is it better to carry out situation analysis only for heritage sector, or should it be done in a more integrated way with other sectors? Who would like to take that? Nobody? Okay, I'll go. 
Okay. Um, yeah, um, it certainly must be integrated. It, um, it, it does not help to actually work in silos. And one thing, and that's something that we learned at FAC, at the First Aid to Culture um, course, you, you have to um, take into consideration um, intergovernmental help. You have to look at the humanitarian sector. Um, you have to look at heritage, the heritage sector as well, because it, it, it also brings your institution or your, what your, your outlook is to a wider audience. And it could give you a lot of traction if you have in, um, interdisciplinary fields coming together to help in this initiative. So it, it shouldn't just be taken up by one group, but sure. as much people, as much organizations that you could actually get involved, it could help your cause. Thank you, Helson. And I would augment that reply by saying that indeed, uh, if you are looking, if you cast your web, uh, web uh, you know, far and wider, uh, this way you will be able to identify unusual actors who might be able to help you. And uh, uh, you would also be able to see who are the uh, resource partners that are being accessed by others. So coordination certainly helps to save time, money, and effort as we have already highlighted. So on that note, I would like to uh, thank all our panelists uh, for their insightful uh, presentations. And uh, at the same time, I would also like to thank our attendees for their um, uh, presence here and asking us questions. There are many, many questions and very interesting ones which we have not been able to answer because of the time that we have allocated. Uh, what we would do is that we would uh, uh, share the email shortly I would like to announce that uh, next Friday, I hope you have enjoyed this presentation and that next Friday at the same time, we are going to have another um, webinar, uh, which will be on uh, how we can use heritage sites for uh, you know, alternate uses and how we have to, what we have to consider while reopening them. So it's reopening and adapting heritage places during a pandemic. And our panelists will be Rohit Jigyasu from Ikram, Eva Martinez from Honduras, and Rebecca Kennedy from USA. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you same time next week. I thank you again for being with us and stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you very much.